conspiracy, one of the darkest words in the language of men. Yet there is hardly a single page of history that doesn't partially reveal the deadly eye of conspiracy at work. It was a conspiracy that directed Brutus against Caesar in the Roman Senate on the Ides of March. It was a conspiracy that plotted the betrayal of West Point by Benedict Arnold during the American Revolution. It was a conspiracy that led John Wilkes Booth to the assassination of President Lincoln on Good Friday, 1865. The past record of man is burdened with accounts of assassinations, secret combines, palace plots, and betrayals in war. The tenet of conspiracy has been a dominant force in all history. But in spite of this clear record, an amazing number of people have begun to scoff at the possibility of conspiracy at work today. They dismiss such an idea merely as a conspiratorial view of history. The purpose of this presentation is to show that the conspiratorial view of history, particularly of recent history, is the correct view. That there is a secret and powerful combine at work today. That it constitutes the unseen government of the United States. And that it properly can be identified as the capitalist conspiracy. In 1963, the nation was held spellbound by the testimony of gangster Joe Valachi as he exposed the inside workings of the international crime syndicate known as the Cosa Nostra or the Mafia. No matter how carefully criminal conspiracies are organized, eventually they're exposed because someone on the inside goes to the authorities and talks. The same is true with political conspiracies. For instance, over the years, there has been a steady stream of defectors from the communist apparatus, and through their testimony, we now have a clear idea of how that conspiracy is organized and operated. But one large piece of the puzzle always has been missing. It's a matter of record that some of the greatest help to world communism often has come from prominent and respectable leaders within the United States. Obviously, these men are not communists. As a matter of fact, most of them are extremely wealthy and are thought of as capitalists who supposedly would have the most to lose under socialism and communism. And yet the record is disturbingly consistent. And Americans repeatedly have asked why. Why have some of the richest people in the United States, both in and outside of government, aligned themselves with leftist policies that would appear to be the path to their own destruction? And if there is a conspiracy at work among these men, why hasn't someone on the inside exposed it? The answer is, someone has. Dr. Carol Quigley is a professor of history at Georgetown University. He is the author of the widely used textbook, Evolution of Civilization. He is a member of the editorial board of the monthly periodical, Current History. He has been a frequent lecturer and consultant for such groups as the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, the Brookings Institution, the U.S. Naval Weapons Laboratory, the Naval College, the Smithsonian Institute, and the State Department. Dr. Quigley also has been closely associated with many of the family dynasties of the super-rich. He is, by his own boast, an insider with a front-row view of the world's money power structure. When Dr. Quigley wrote this 1,300-page book of dry history entitled Tragedy and Hope, it was obvious that it would never be read by the masses. It was intended for the intellectual elite. And to such a select readership, Dr. Quigley cautiously exposed one of the best-kept secrets of all time. But he also made it quite clear that he was an extremely friendly apologist for this group and that he fully supports their goals and purposes. On page 950, Dr. Quigley says, I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments. In general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown. 
Dr. Quigley points out that during the past 200 years, while the peoples of the world gradually were winning their political freedom from monarchies, the major banking families of the world were nullifying the trend toward representative government by setting up new dynasties of political control, but behind the scenes in the form of international financial combines. These banking dynasties had learned that all governments, whether they be monarchies or democracies, must borrow money in times of emergency, and that by providing such funds from their own private resources, with strings attached, of course, gradually they could bring both kings and democratic leaders under their control. Dr. Quigley believes that people should be more familiar with the identities of these clever banking dynasties. They include such names as Baring, Hambros, Lazard, Erlanger, Warburg, Schroeder, Seligman, the Spires, Mirabeau, Mallet, Fold, and above all, Rothschild and Morgan. It should be noted that while the Rothschilds and other Jewish families cooperated together in these ventures, this was by no means a Jewish monopoly, as some have alleged. Men of finance of many nationalities and many religious and non-religious backgrounds collaborated together to create this superstructure of hidden power. Its essence was not race, nor religion, nor nationality. It was simply a passion for control over other human beings. Dr. Quigley identifies this group simply as the international bankers. These are not the same as the local commercial bankers with whom we deal in everyday life. International bankers deal not with the general public, but with the industrial giants of the world, with other financial institutions, and especially with governments. The key to their success has been to control and manipulate the money system of a nation, while letting it appear to be controlled by the government. The net effect is to create money out of nothing, lend it to the government, and then collect interest on it, a rather profitable transaction, to say the least. For example, in 1694, international banker William Patterson obtained the charter of the Bank of England, and the power over England's money system fell into private hands. In a boastful mood, Patterson said, The bank hath benefit of interest on all monies which it creates out of nothing. 230 years later, Reginald McKenna, British Chancellor of the Exchequer, said, The banks can and do create money, and they who control the credit of the nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hallow of their hands the destiny of the people. Turning to the United States, Dr. Quigley tells us, The structure of financial controls created by the tycoons of big banking and big business in the period 1880 to 1933 was of extraordinary complexity, one business fief being built on another, both being allied with semi-independent associates, the whole rearing upward into two pinnacles of economic and financial power. One, centered in New York, was headed by J.P. Morgan and Company, and the other, in Ohio, was headed by the Rockefeller family. When these two cooperated, as they generally did, they could influence the economic life of the country to a large degree, and could almost control its political life, at least on the federal level. In the United States, it was inevitable that the international banking interests would attempt to establish the same kind of private monopoly over the money system that they had achieved in England, France, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. The same formula would be used, make it look like a government operation, but keep the control in private hands. John D. Rockefeller had purchased the Chase Bank, and his brother William bought the National City Bank of New York. The Rockefeller Chase Bank was later merged with the Warburg's Manhattan Bank to form the Chase Manhattan, one of the most powerful financial combines in the world today. Acting in concert with the Morgan banking dynasty, they spent untold millions of dollars to promote legislation that would grant to them a private franchise over this nation's money system. To sell this scheme to the voters, the monopolists created the propaganda line that the proposed banking law somehow would work against the monopolies. Politicians took up the cry, banking reform, and down with Wall Street. And then, to make it look convincing, the financial tycoons publicly pretended to oppose the measure, 
all the while financing it behind the scenes. On December 22, 1913, the Federal Reserve Act finally was passed into law. Something known as the Federal Reserve System came into being, and with it, total control over the nation's money fell into private hands. The Federal Reserve System solely is responsible for creating money in the United States. The Treasury prints only what the Federal Reserve tells it to print. The far greater amount of checkbook money is also determined by this group. Yet it is not a government agency and is entirely beyond the reach of the American voter. Technically, the stock of the Federal Reserve System is held by 12 privately owned national banks that make up the system. These, in turn, are owned primarily by the private banking dynasties that work so hard to bring that system into being. By law, the seven members of the Federal Reserve Board are appointed by the President for a term of 14 years each. In spite of the incredible length of these appointments, nevertheless, they're supposed to create the illusion that the people, acting through their elected leaders, have some voice in the nation's monetary policies. In practice, however, every president since the beginning of the Federal Reserve System has appointed only those men who were congenial to the financial interests of the international banking dynasties. There have been no exceptions. It is now known that the original Federal Reserve Board was handpicked by Colonel Edward Mandel House, who early in his career had represented British and American banking interests. The intimate papers of Colonel House, edited by Charles Seymour, reveal House as the unseen guardian angel of the Federal Reserve System. In the words of Mr. Seymour, the Schiffs, the Warburgs, the Cons, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans had faith in House. In 1912, Colonel House authored this book entitled Philip Drew, Administrator. The hero, a thinly disguised version of himself in real life, was a behind-the-scenes manipulator of prominent political figures. In the disguised form of a novel, the book lays bare the general strategy that has been followed ever since, even to the very present. It tells of how a small group of insiders cause a depression and then bring about the election of a man named Rockland. Rockland gives fireside chats and launches a program called the New Era to strengthen government control over the masses. Eventually, the insiders who control the government weaken the country deliberately to the point of civil war, which provides them with the excuse for establishing a dictatorship under Philip Drew. Colonel House was the man who selected Woodrow Wilson as a presidential candidate and later became his principal advisor. Wilson was totally dependent on House for all political decisions. He was his alter ego. The president himself had written, Mr. House is my second personality. He is my independent self. His thoughts and mine are one. If I were in his place, I would do just as he suggested. When the federal government goes into debt, it borrows that money from the Federal Reserve System. The national debt presently is at the 400 billion mark. Just to pay the interest on this debt, taxpayers are forced to contribute over 20 billion dollars every year. And remember, that is interest on money created out of nothing. At national convention time, Twenty billion dollars can determine far more politics than all the shouting and placard waving and brass bands combined. And one can only imagine the economic and political pressures that are brought to bear on a candidate seeking public office. Pressures and commitments to make sure that if elected, the new president will make the correct appointments, not only to the Federal Reserve Board, but also to ambassadorial posts, government agencies, the cabinet, and even the Supreme Court. This is why, through the years, administrations change, party labels change, but major policies do not. In 1870, a wealthy British socialist by the name of John Ruskin was appointed as Professor of Fine Arts at Oxford University in London. He taught his students that the state must take control of the means of production and organize them for the good of the community as a whole. 
but he advocated placing control of the state into the hands of a single dictator. He said, My continual aim has been to show the eternal superiority of some men to others, sometimes even of one man to all others. Dr. Quigley tells us, Ruskin spoke to the Oxford undergraduates as members of the privileged ruling class. He told them that they were the possessors of a magnificent tradition of education, beauty, rule of law, freedom, decency, and self-discipline. But that this tradition could not be saved unless it could be extended to the lower classes in England itself and to the non-English masses throughout the world. Ruskin's message had a sensational impact. His inaugural lecture was copied out in longhand by one undergraduate, Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. Cecil Rhodes made one of the world's greatest fortunes. With help from international bankers, he was able to establish a virtual monopoly over all the diamonds that came from South Africa, and most of the gold as well. Throughout his entire life, Cecil Rhodes spent most of his vast income to promote the ruling class ideas of John Ruskin. Many people are familiar with the world-famous Rhodes Scholarships, which were established to promote the less controversial aspects of John Ruskin's dream. But very few are familiar with the fact that in 1891, Cecil Rhodes established a secret society to promote the rest of that dream. Dr. Quigley explains, In this secret society, Rhodes was to be leader. Stead, Brett, Lord Escher, and Milner were to form an executive committee. Arthur Lord Balfour, Sir Harry Johnston, Lord Rothschild, Albert Lord Grey and others were listed as potential members of a circle of initiates, while there was to be an outer circle known as the Association of Helpers, later organized by Milner as the Round Table Organization. Here then was the classic pattern of political conspiracies throughout all history. At the center, usually depicted as the all-seeing eye, there is a tiny group in complete control, with one man as the undisputed leader. Next comes a circle of secondary leadership that for the most part is completely unaware of an inner core. They are led to believe that they are the innermost ring. In time, as these conspiracies are built from the center out, they form additional rings of organization. Those in the outer echelons usually are poor idealistic souls with an honest desire to improve the world. They never suspect an inner control for sinister purposes and only those few who demonstrate a ruthless capacity for higher leadership are ever allowed to see it. After the death of Cecil Rhodes, the inner core of his secret society fell to the hands of Lord Alfred Milner, Governor General and High Commissioner of South Africa. As director of a number of public banks and corporate precursor of England's Midland Bank, he became one of the greatest political and financial powers in the world. Milner recruited into his secret society a group of young men, chiefly from Oxford and Toynbee Hall. And according to Quigley, through his influence, these men were able to win influential posts in government and international finance and became the dominant influence in British imperial and foreign affairs up to 1939. Under Milner in South Africa, they were known as Milner's Kindergarten until 1910. In 1909 to 1913, they organized semi-secret groups known as roundtable groups in the chief British dependencies and in the United States. The roundtable group in the United States promptly created an external organization known as the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations. It is through this organizational ring and then outward, through tax-exempt foundations, universities, and government agencies, that the international capitalist conspiracy has dominated the domestic and foreign policies of the United States for over 50 years. Unless there is any doubt as to who is behind the CFR, Dr. Quigley tells us bluntly, in New York it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with the very small American Roundtable Group. The CFR building is located on the west side of fashionable Park Avenue in New York. Although it definitely is not the center of the conspiracy, and although practically none of its members are aware of an inner control, nevertheless it is semi-secret in its operation. It shuns publicity, and members are sworn not to disclose to the public the proceedings of its conferences and briefings. 
it has a formal membership of 1,400 elite personalities. In Harper's Magazine of July 1958, there is an article entitled School for Statesmen, written by CFR member Joseph Kraft. Kraft revealed that one of the chief architects for the CFR was none other than Colonel Edward Mandel House. At the time of writing this article, Mr. Kraft boasted that the CFR membership even then included the President, the Secretary of State, the Chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the board chairman of three of the country's five largest industrial corporations, two of the four richest insurance companies, and two of the three biggest banks, plus the senior partners of two of the three leading Wall Street law firms, the publishers of the two biggest news magazines and of the country's most influential newspaper, and the presidents of the big three in both universities and foundations, as well as a score of other college presidents, a scattering of top scientists and journalists. The CFR from behind the scenes has dominated this nation for decades. CFR members include top executives and journalists for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Daily News, Harper's, Look, Time, Life, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, CBS, NBC, MGM. They include directors of the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment Fund, they include Presidents Hoover, Eisenhower, Johnson, and Nixon, Secretaries of State Statinius, Atchison, Dulles, Herter, and Rusk, a fantastic percentage of the President's Cabinet, Undersecretaries, the Federal Reserve Board, Ambassadors to other countries, Supreme Court Justices, and Presidential Advisors. The average American has never heard of the CFR, yet it is the unseen government of the United States. It's a sobering fact that the hidden power structure of international finance has exerted tremendous influence over public opinion in this country through its virtual control of higher education and major segments of mass communications. The human mind is like a computer. No matter how efficient it may be, its reliability is only as great as the information fed into it. If it is possible to control the input of the human mind, then no matter how intelligent a person may be, it's entirely possible to program what he will think. And yes, it's even possible to program people to laugh at the mere mention of the word conspiracy. Such programming, of course, can work in both directions. While one group has been conditioned not to see any conspiracy at work, another group has been led to believe that communists have been behind practically everything, a position easily made to look ridiculous. These well-intentioned anti-communists have been correct in their charge of conspiracy, but incorrect in knowing who to blame. As far back as 1907, Trotsky was financed by British bankers. By 1917, the major financing for the communist revolution in Russia was coming through Lord Alfred Milner, the leader of that inner core within the roundtable groups and the CFR. In America, Jacob Schiff of Kuhn, Loeb & Company gave $20 million to Trotsky. From Germany, millions more came from Max Warburg. The communist movement, not only in the United States, but around the world, always has been financed by the international banking establishment. Dr. Quigley explains why the establishment has never greatly worried about the communist movement in America. He says, it must be recognized that the power that these energetic left-wingers exercised was never their own power or communist power, but was ultimately the power of the international financial coterie. In the 1950s, when the public became aroused over evidence of communist subversion in the federal government, it was a simple expedient to have a promising young congressman from California dramatically expose one communist agent. The establishment press gave it extensive coverage, the public was placated, and the obscure congressman became a national hero almost overnight. But when Congressman Reese of Tennessee began to investigate the link-up between Alger Hiss, the Carnegie Endowment, the Morgan Bank, and the interlocking tax-exempt foundations, the establishment press and the administration moved mightily against him. The pressures were so great that he was forced to abandon his investigation and no one has dared to try it since. 
After a man has far more money than he possibly can spend for pleasures, what is left to excite him? For those with a ruling class mentality, the answer is power, raw power over other human beings. Money can buy such power only to a point. Beyond that, politics is the sport, and world politics is the ultimate game. For the purposes of this presentation, we have referred to those in the international power structure as capitalists. But these men are not really capitalists in the classical sense. They are merely rich socialists. They have gained their vast wealth not through honest competition and free enterprise, but by political influence and favoritism, the granting of government protection to eliminate competition, and by gigantic fraud of the money system, backed by government force. These men are striving to create a world superstate, with the expectation that from behind the scenes they will be the ones who will rule. Not free enterprise capitalism, but big government is the conspiracy's life force. World government is its ultimate goal. But what is the best way to sell big government and then world government to a people like ours, historically devoted to an independent republic of limited powers? The answer is simple. In revolutionary literature, the tactic is known as pressure from above and below. It's the strategy that Colonel House laid down in his book, Philip Drew, Administrator. Deliberately create problems, and then offer only those solutions that result in the expansion of government. Create conditions so frightful at home and abroad that the abandonment of personal liberties and national sovereignty will appear as a reasonable price for a return to domestic tranquility and world peace. If those who seek world dominion can stimulate leftist mobs into violent confrontation with local law enforcement, and also provide exhaustive news coverage so that the entire nation can see and tremble, then the peaceful and freedom-loving majority can be programmed to accept a vast expansion of government powers and even a national police force offered supposedly to end the violence. If those who seek world dominion can raise the specter of an enemy, armed to the teeth with superior atomic weapons on the verge of launching a nuclear holocaust, and also offer world government as the prevention, then millions of Americans can be programmed to accept the loss of national sovereignty as our last best hope for peace. This is the meaning of pressure from above and below. To put over police state measures at home, they need chaos, crime, and anarchy in the streets. To sell the idea of world government, they need the constant threat of nuclear war. Or, as they say in revolutionary circles, the real action is in the reaction. In 1968, Random House Incorporated published this book by James Coonan, The Strawberry Statement, Notes of a College Revolutionary. Coonan carries the usual new left credentials and is a classic example of the extent to which a highly intelligent mind can be programmed by the establishment into thinking that it is acting against the establishment. Kunin was one of the leading participants in the first student seizure of an American university, which occurred at Columbia in April of 1968. Initially, the movement was not large, and easily could have been stopped by a simple police action. But, as usual, the anti-establishment forces received their greatest help from the establishment itself. For several days, police were told not to interfere. Meanwhile, university officials groveled in the face of outrageous propaganda charges, and the media made national heroes of the rebelling students. MGM even made a movie out of Kunin's book. On page 130, Kunin wrote, In the evening, I went up to the U to check out a strategy meeting. A kid was giving a report on the SDS convention. He said that, at the convention, men from Business International Roundtables, the meeting sponsored by Business International for their client groups and heads of government, tried to buy up a few radicals. They offered to finance our demonstrations in Chicago. We were also offered ESSO, or Rockefeller money. They want us to make a lot of radical commotion so they can look more in the center as they move to the left. Jerry Kirk, while a student at the University of Chicago, was active in the SDS, the Du Bois Club, the Black Panthers, and the Communist Party. In 1969, Mr. Kirk broke from the party 
and the following year testified before the House and Senate Internal Security Committees. Here is what Mr. Kirk has told us. Young people have no conception of the conspiracy strategy of pressure from above and pressure from below. They have no idea that they're playing into the hands of the establishment they claim to hate. The radicals think they're fighting the forces of the super-rich, like Rockefeller and Ford, and don't realize that it is precisely such forces which are behind their own revolution, financing it, and using it for their own purposes. When Stokely Carmichael was head of the militant revolutionary group known as SNCC, he was invited to speak at the University of Chicago. Jerry Kirk, then still a Black Panther, was among those who attended, and here is how he described Carmichael's appearance. Mr. Carmichael was obviously in the middle of something rather important, which made him more nervous and more tense than in the past. He started speaking of things which he said he could not have said before, because his research was not finished. He spoke of the false consciousness of many blacks who believed the Jews were the instrument of oppression of blacks. And he made note of the fact that even though many Jewish people, for example in New York, own quite a bit of land, one must understand that the overwhelming percentages of mortgages in Harlem was owned not by Jewish people, but by Morgan Guarantee Trust, the Morgan family, and Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefellers. He repeated the line from the song he liked so well. Something is happening here, but you don't know quite what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? What he was getting at was that the Jews were simply one strata of society who are themselves being oppressed by people who were much richer and much more powerful. In the agencies of this power, he cited banks, the chief among which were Morgan Guarantee Trust and Chase Manhattan and the foundations connected with these monoliths. It was not long after this that Stokely Carmichael mysteriously was ousted from both SNCC and the Black Panthers. Apparently, he had learned too much. More and more, young radicals are beginning to wake up to the fact that their entire lives have been carefully programmed by the very people who are their hate symbols. They're beginning to realize that their so-called anti-establishment outlook actually is the calculated product of the establishment press, the establishment communications media, the establishment entertainment industry, the establishment schools. Rich men's corporations publish and popularize revolutionary books and songs. Through advertising, rich men's businesses subsidize revolutionary magazines. Rich men's tax-exempt foundations pour millions of dollars into left-wing organizations. The federal establishment in Washington through agencies like the OEO, provide weekly paychecks to thousands of hardcore revolutionaries. And so we return again to the basic question, why? Why does the establishment publicly condemn, but privately support the anti-establishment movement? Former communist Jerry Kirk answers, The idea is to create a situation where the people are so frightened of the violence all around them that they will throw their hands up in the air and demand federal government do something. And the only choice open will be martial law. The communists, black militants, and revolutionaries will never succeed in overthrowing the government of the United States. But unless they are stopped, they will scare the American people into accepting socialism from Washington and statist rule by the insiders of the establishment. This is what it is really all about. In Bavaria, the year 1786, acting on a tip from an informer, police raided the home of a prominent attorney named von Zwack. They seized documents and letters revealing that he was a high-ranking member of an extensive conspiracy called the Order of the Illuminati. Over the centuries, forms of the word Illuminati, meaning the enlightened ones, have been used by many secret sects and occult organizations. Most prominent among these were the Illuminados of Spain, the Guirine of France, and the Roshania of Afghanistan. But these were concerned primarily with psychological and spiritual objectives, a proclaimed inner wisdom and mind mastery of the secrets of the universe. The conspiracy exposed in Bavaria was of an entirely different order. The Illuminati was founded on May 1, 1776, by Adam Weishaupt, a professor at Ingolstadt University. 
Weissop obviously had been a serious student of the occult, for many of its bizarre features and symbols were incorporated into his organization. Weissop had been active in the Masonic lodges of Germany, and found in them the perfect vehicle for recruiting into his secret order, which he described publicly as the highest level of Freemasonry. The Illuminati was formally incorporated into the Masonic lodges at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1780. It should be noted that Freemasonry in England and America historically is quite different. Its members are characterized by the highest standards of integrity. Nevertheless, it is a fact that from 1780 on, the Illuminati did flourish as a parasite on the highest levels of the Masonic movement in Europe, especially the Grand Orient Lodges of France. There were eight conspiratorial rings within rings advancing from the outermost novice inward to Rex or King. The King, of course, was Weissop himself, who had adopted the code name Spartacus. Those in the outer rings were told that the grand purpose of the order was to make of the human race without any distinction of nation, condition, or profession one good and happy family. But by the time the member had advanced to the level of presbyter or priest, his oath of absolute secrecy and obedience had become deadly serious. Only then was he allowed finally to see the ultimate goal of the order. It was the destruction of all religion, replaced by the worship of reason or humanism, and the destruction of all independent governments, replaced by a new world order, a world government ruled from behind the scenes by the illuminated ones. Needless to say, most members were never allowed to see these goals. In the words of Adam Weissop himself, these good folks swell our numbers and fill our money box. Set yourselves to work. These gentlemen must be made to nibble at the bait. But this sort of people must always be made to believe that the grade they have reached is the last. The public record of the Illuminati is quite thin, but it does show that before it was exposed briefly in 1786, it had already enjoyed immense success in attracting into its outer rings some of the most prominent men of Europe. Its roster included important names in both government and finance. It was the most important single force behind the French Revolution. Some years later, an obscure intellectual by the name of Karl Marx joined a conspiratorial circle called the League of the Just. Shortly afterward, this group reformed into still another organization called the Communist League. And in 1847, they commissioned Marx to write their policy statement for the public. It was called the Communist Manifesto. On the surface, the manifesto appealed to the workers of the world to arise against their capitalist exploiters. But it should be noted that the project was supervised by Frederick Engels, a capitalist of substantial wealth. Marx himself was so unimportant that his name didn't even appear on the manifesto for the first 20 years after its publication. In 1920, just three years after the Bolsheviks seized Russia, Winston Churchill declared, From the days of Spartacus Weissop, to those of Karl Marx, to those of Trotsky, Bela Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this worldwide conspiracy has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century, and now at last has gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads. Each year, May 1st is celebrated by communists world over as a day of international solidarity. As mentioned previously, the Illuminati also was founded on May 1st. Undoubtedly, this is merely a coincidence. The symbol of the all-seeing eye is closely associated with the Illuminati. Like many other features of this conspiracy, apparently it was taken by Adam Weissop from the occult symbolism of ancient history. It appears today among the symbols of the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, and many others around the world, including the Cao Dai in South Vietnam. Undoubtedly, it is merely a coincidence that the all-seeing eye now appears on the alternate side of the great seal of the federal government and also on the one dollar notes of the federal reserve system. At the bottom of the seal in Roman numerals there is the date 1776. 
This, of course, is the year of American independence. Undoubtedly, it is merely a coincidence that it is also the year of the founding of the Illuminati. But then, perhaps, none of this is merely a coincidence. Is it possible that both the communist and capitalist conspiracies have yet one more inner circle within the circle that is common to them both? Is it possible that both movements, unbeknownst to most of the people in them, are merely contemporary counterparts of a much older conspiracy? There is much evidence, far more than presented here, to indicate that this is the case, but frankly, we don't know. Until someone on the inside of such a master conspiracy decides to reveal its existence today, we simply have no way of finding out. But we do know that it is not impossible, and certainly not absurd. What then is our response? Fortunately, it's not necessary that we resolve the historical question of the conspiracy's origin. Regardless of whether there is one controlling group, or two cooperating, or three competing, or four, or ten, in practical terms of what can be done about it, our response must be the same. Conspiracy, as it operates at the highest level in the United States today, rests upon two solid foundations and enjoys the protection of shelter. If we could knock out its foundations, it would collapse, and if we could strip away its shelter, it would wither and die. The shelter is secrecy. The foundations are big government and manipulation of money. No conspiracy can stand the light of exposure. No conspiracy can rule the masses without the tool of an extensive government bureaucracy. And certainly no capitalist conspiracy can long survive without control over the nation's money. Expose the conspiracy. Reduce the size of government. Return our money to a standard that cannot be manipulated. This must be our response. In the limited time available, we have attempted to demonstrate that the conspiratorial view of history, particularly of recent history, is the correct view. Let us summarize now seven major conclusions. 1. There is and has been for some time a conspiracy among some of the richest people in the world, a conspiracy that virtually owns the money systems of the major non-communist nations. This monopoly is protected by the power of the respective governments, and is used to perpetuate the conspiracy's vast wealth by the creation of money out of nothing. 2. In the United States, this monetary fraud is perpetuated through the Federal Reserve System. Although the executive branch theoretically has some control over this system through occasional appointments, in reality it is the system and those behind it who control the executive branch. 3. The capitalist conspiracy in this country surfaces to public view in the form of the semi-secret Council on Foreign Relations. Its members exercise their control over the nation through government, tax-exempt foundations, centers of education, and the mass communications media. 4. On the surface, the capitalist conspiracy appears to oppose communism. It spends billions of dollars in spectacular military displays of anti-communism all around the world, but never to the extent of seriously harming the enemy, and certainly not to the extent of defeating him. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the conspiracy always has nourished and aided communism both at home and abroad. It does this not because it is pro-communist, but because it needs the appearance of a formidable foe, and the chaos byproduct of a managed conflict to advance its own goal of totalitarian world government. 5. There is much evidence indicating that the capitalist and communist conspiracies both are directed by a single master conspiracy which may have continuity with the order of the Illuminati, which was founded 200 years ago. But this historical question is not nearly as important as the immediate question of what can be done about it today. 6. As for our response, we must begin to dismantle the conspiracy's machine of big government. We must restore American independence. We must return our schools to local control. We must protect our police forces from federal aid, which is the certain path to a national police force controlled from Washington. 
We must denounce revenue sharing as a transparent device leading to control over local government. We must raise up men for political office who not only talk about reducing government, but who will do it once they're elected. And that means men who are totally independent of establishment politics. 7. We must reduce the Federal Reserve System to a service function of clearing checks between banks only. Merely turning the system as it stands over to the Federal Government, as some have suggested, will not solve the problem. The same people would control it either way. The root of the evil is that money is created out of nothing, and the insiders could do that today just as easily directly through government as they do through the Federal Reserve System. The ultimate solution is to prevent anyone in or out of government from manipulating the money supply. And the only way to do that is to return our money to the gold and silver standards. 8. We must expose the conspiracy to public view. If somehow every American could be made aware of the facts contained in this presentation, if it were possible to circumvent the establishment's channels of mass communication and carry this message person to person to our friends and neighbors and fellow club members, the conspiracy would collapse like a house of cards. Yes, the hour is late, but it is not too late if we are realistic in our efforts. As Americans, we can still speak out without fear of imprisonment. We can still join together into patriotic groups to multiply our effectiveness. We can still challenge the establishment's candidates. We still retain that remnant of power to regain control of our own government. With divine guidance and with your help, it can be done.